This is CBC Here and Now. Proud Labradorian John Hickey succumbs to his injuries. My brother was, a, you know, a, a voice that he, he was passionate. He had passion for Labrador like you wouldn't believe in the people. You want to bargain in good faith? Well, maybe you should have told the rest of the government that. Nurses fume, and now the province's top health bureaucrat is apologizing. Dreams and schemes and circus crowds. I took that life that life that way. Making it to the top, Holy Heart and St. Bonds win CBC Music Awards. Get your storm chips ready. We're here at Coleman's Market in St. John's. We're talking about the incoming snowstorm for the Avalon and what items are must have in your house during a storm. Our top story, John Hickey, the mayor of Happy Valley Goose Bay and former MHA has died. Hickey's family told CBC he passed away last night in St. John's. The 62 year old was by himself checking rabbit snares when he was shot under the chin last weekend. He managed to make it out of the woods on his snowmobile and was airlifted to St. John's. Here now is Jacob Barker is outside the town hall in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Jacob, how are people reacting to Hickey's death? Well, it's a day to mourn and a day to remember here in Happy Valley Goose Bay when news of the mayor's death uh, came in th this morning. It hit the community hard. The flags at Town Hall were lowered to half mast today. Town services reduced to essential services. We've shunned the staff home uh, to take the time and, and reflect on uh, uh, our mayor who uh, unfortunately we lost last night. Wally Anderson stepped in as acting mayor after the accident last weekend. He knows he has big shoes to fill. Something that uh, I wish uh, Mayor Hickey was here to do, but uh, I will take on these responsibilities. Others who worked with him over the years, hopeful he would pull through. This morning's news came unexpected. He was a strong-willed person and, and stubborn, you can probably say too, and you know, just we felt that fighting spirit would, would keep him going and, and get him through this and, and get him through a recovery. But unfortunately, it hasn't, hasn't worked out that way and you know the, the worst has happened and we're all just devastated. While we've been certainly aware of just how serious uh, his condition has been these last few days and, and the fight that he's been uh, embarked upon, uh, we had some degree of confidence he was going to get through. Uh, it's not the case. But for all today is their memories of a beloved man. I mean, he touched so many people and he knew so many people. I'm not surprised at all. I mean, I can expect we're going to see a large gathering of people in Goose Bay the next few days to, to say their final goodbyes to him because he just he was just so well known and so well loved by so many people. We have to uh, ensure that Labradorians get the maximum benefits. And, that's and the commitment to continue about. what he started in just a few short them. months yeah. as mayor. The good news, I guess, out of all this is that uh, I think there's a great commitment on so many of us to carry on so many of his wishes. So I'm, I'm glad for the time I've had with him the last few months. I've, I've known the man close to 25 years. Uh, it's, it's really been very um, good to have worked with him in this capacity these last few months. We as a, a council now have to, uh, to uh, uh, mourn. We have to uh, pick up the pieces and we'll move forward because at the end of the day uh, the council still has to uh, operate the town and you know that's what John would advise us you know to carry on and 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 look after the people of Happy Valley Goose Bay. Well this isn't just a loss for the community of Happy Valley Goose Bay many are also saying this is a huge loss of a big advocate for the entire uh, land of Labrador. Reporting live for Here and Now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. Now, as Jacob mentioned, the dramatic way that John Hickey got out of the bush and all the way to hospital in St. John's gave the Hickeys hope that he might recover. Surgeons said it could take weeks to determine his survival, but the gunshot wounds to his face were serious and he lost too much blood. I met with his brother Hubert to talk about how he and his family are dealing with such a random freak accident. Very sorry and condolences for what's happened to your brother. Thanks. 
a lot of us who were watching the story sort of figured that maybe uh, he'd been through the danger zone, so a lot of shock. Uh, what can you tell us about what's happened over the last 72 hours? Well, the last 72 hours has been a sort of a wait-see game kind of thing. You know, like we really found out the issues and the major problems back on Tuesday. So, you know, we were told pretty well then that, you know, that was, but we, again, weren't sure and then so the last 72 hours, yes, it's, it's been a roller coaster, no needless to say. I mean, when the first reports that he, he managed to make it out of the bush in a horrific circumstances was airlifted, uh, what can you tell us about the extent of, of your brother's injuries? Well, it was an injury, you know, it was a, it was a you know, a gun in injury, and um, he lost a lot of blood. Um, it was amazing to get out on Skidoo and wave someone down. I mean, he had to wave someone down to get their attention, to call for an ambulance. The ambulance service was there in a jiffy, and then they got him in hospital. The staff at the hospital were second to none. There was people came back from Christmas parties to help out. You know, it was fantastic. Were you able through any of this to actually communicate with with your brother, or was he unconscious? Um, he's, um, they, uh, when he was in the hospital in, in Happy Valley, uh, he did come to for a short while, and he and, you know he did see his partner Peggy and. And um, you know, and they just had a glance, that kind of thing. But other than that, he's was sort of been unconscious ever since. You know? All right. A lot of people, of course, knew your brother very well as a politician, um, and they think of him that way. How would you like people to to remember your brother? Well, you know, my brother was, a, you know, a, a voice that he he was passion. He had passion for Labrador, like you would believe, and the people of Labrador. Um, and he believed in in helping and wanted to help people, you know, uh, his reason for getting back in politics, I mean, politics is a, is a blood thing, and once you get it in, it's hard to get it out. Yeah. And, uh, but he saw so many things he could do, and he thought that would make things better, and, and things he wanted to get for Labrador, and improve, and even though municipally, he still saw an opportunity, and saw things that, you know, in the long run, it would, it would help, and so, you know, he just felt there was something he wanted to give back. He just loved giving back to the, to the you know, people. Right. In terms of your relationship with him, when was the last time that you saw him? I uh, saw him there one time this summer. He was out because he was having a, a bit of a medical issue uh, that he had to come back and forth for a while. But I mean, I talked to him on a regular basis. I just talked to him like literally three or four days prior to this, you know. Mm. And I mean, he would always talk about going off, checking his rabbit snares, and telling me that the, the ptarmigans up there now, like he, he used to love shoot ptarmigans. Right. And, and uh, you know, so that's pretty well. So, I know this is a difficult subject for you, but w one last question. How do you, how do you and your family, how do you process such a, a random freak accident like this by a guy who's really knew the bush inside out? How do you, how do you make sense of this? You can't. You know, you, you just can't make sense of it. I mean, we, we honestly thought that, that he was going to pull through this. Once they got him out there, there was a lot of trouble stabilizing him to get him to, in a med medevac situation. But once they got him there, we really thought he was going to get it. And then when we talked to the surgeon, who was fantastic at the Health Science Center, and by the way, the people at the Health Science Center are fantastic. You know, like, what do you do? Yeah. What are you going to miss the most? The conversations. Thank you very much. Thanks. John Hickey was originally from Conception Bay, but had called Labrador home since 1974. Hickey was a lineman with Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro for 25 years, but is best remembered for his political career. Let's send a message loud and clear. We want to trans Labrador Highway. We John Hickey was a councillor in Happy Valley Goose Bay for 15 years and then became mayor in 2003. We have to uh, ensure that Labradorians get the maximum benefits. And that's but that year, he about. made the move to provincial politics and served in the progressive conservative governments of Danny Williams and Kathy Dunderdale. That I will be faithful and bear true allegiance. Hickey later became Minister of Transportation and then Minister of Labrador Affairs, resigning from provincial politics in 2011. After failing in his bid for mayor of Happy Valley Goose Bay in 2013, he ran again this September and won decisively by 800 votes. Today at Confederation Building, flags were flying at half-mast in honor of John Hickey.
Premier Dwight Ball and provincial ministers are extending their condolences today, as is former Premier Danny Williams. He says he was honored to have worked with Hickey in public life. Rarely have I met an individual so dedicated and passionate in representing the people he served. Labradorians will probably never fully know the enormous contribution that he made on their behalf. He was not only a colleague, but also a good friend. He was hardworking, loyal, and kind-hearted. A well-known St. John's doctor has lost his battle against cancer. Michael Benz passed away Tuesday at the age of 70. Benz, who came to Newfoundland from South Africa in 1971, was a pioneer of laser eye surgery. For a time, he was chief of ophthalmology at the Health Sciences Centre, and he performed more than 30,000 eye surgeries during his lengthy career. The funeral service is set for Monday at St. Pius X Church in St. John's. And the founder and president of one of the province's leading seafood companies, Quinlan Brothers Limited, has died. Pat Quinlan passed away early Friday morning. He was 88. Quinlan was from the Bay de Verde area where he began operating a seafood processing plant in the mid-1950s. A massive fire in 2016 completely destroyed that plant, but the area remains the hub for operations. The company rallied to rebuild and reopen this spring. Here's Pat Quinlan speaking to the CBC about the future of the fishery more than four decades ago. Well, to me, the future looks bright. We have some of the best fishermen within the island here. We have all the confidence in the world in them, really. And facilities are getting better for handling fish. Communications are getting better. Wharves are being constructed. Roads, breakwaters out here are being constructed. So I have uh, no doubt at all that uh, for the future, things just look bright. A slap in the face, an outright betrayal. That's how the province's registered nurses union is reacting to a story we aired last night on Here and Now, featuring some very candid comments by John Abbott, the Deputy Minister of Health. And today, an apology from the man who caused the furor. Here and Now's Terry Roberts reports. The nurses union is accusing the province of upending the collective bargaining process. Our members today are feeling like they've been slapped in the face by this government. And quite frankly, you know, they're angry and I'm angry at the comments that were made. It's because of comments like this, made to the CBC by Deputy Health Minister John Abbott. We don't have as productive nursing workforce as we should. Do we meet, need as many nurses as we have now? I would say no. Forward says her members are furious. Essentially, this government has told registered nurses that they're not working hard enough that they really don't have a workload issue, that there are too many of them in this province. The union has been lobbying for more RNs, saying it would reduce sick leave rates, improve health care outcomes, and reduce overall costs. If they could go to work with reasonable workloads, then they probably wouldn't need to call in sick tomorrow because they can't face another shift like the shift that they work today. The tension comes at a delicate time and Forward says it raises some big questions. My members are ringing my phone off the hook. I'm getting email after email saying, what is this government up to? How can we trust them? How can we trust that they're going to do anything positive for health care? So what does John Abbott make of all this? Well, he's softening his position. He issued a statement today saying any facts he presented were not intended to reflect government policy. He also apologized for any heightened tension. Terry Roberts, CBC News. St. John's. A school bus and a small car collided in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips this morning, and now police are trying to figure out what caused that accident. There was only one student on the bus at the time. The accident happened in the Windsor Heights area just after 8.30. Neither the student nor the bus driver was hurt. The driver of the car was also not injured. The car had to be towed out of a ditch. There was only slight damage to the bus. The weather has improved somewhat in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, allowing marine Atlantic ferries to start sailing again. As of this morning, there were almost 350 commercial trucks or containers held up in North Sydney and Port Basque. They've been waiting out bad weather. The company got two crossings in yesterday when the weather cleared briefly, but by midnight, conditions worsened and the boats had to dock again. Tonight, the ship's captains say they are seeing better weather, so an extra commercial crossing was scheduled. It's hoped the backlog can be cleared up quickly. 
Well, it's time now to check in with Ryan to talk about the weather. And as you can see, he's not with us uh, in the studio. That's right. He has taken a show on the road. And he's joining us now from Coleman's Grocery Store in the east end of St. John's. Hi there, Ryan. Hi, Anthony. Hi, Debbie. And uh, what a scene we have here. A steady stream of folks coming in. We have Colleen Power playing live behind us. Some beautiful guitar. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a steady stream, as I said, coming in. And uh, there's a lot of hustle and bustle, not just because of the Christmas season, but because of what's on the way. And why don't we get right to that in the snowfall map? Uh, this is what we're thinking by the time we get to Sunday morning. Now, a couple of notes here. Note the area in pink for the southeast Avalon, the southern shore. We are talking about 15 to 25 centimeters on the way for that area. Because of the mixing, amounts a little bit lower. Now, Metro, I have in the 25 to 35 range right now. But if we see more mixing in Metro, then amounts might be a little bit on the lower end. But right now, I think we'll see mostly snow and enough to see uh, 20 to as much as 35. Now, amounts drop off as you work your way west, as you can see. Let's ru quickly run through the timeline uh, because everybody wants to know, when's it getting here? Well, uh, quiet to start tomorrow. It looks like the snow will arrive through the morning hours. By the time we get to the noon hour, it's really starting to ramp up. And through the afternoon hours, really starting to see some of those heaviest snowfall amounts, which I think will be heaviest between early afternoon and mid evening tomorrow. Note that mixing line that will get awfully close to St. John's winds really ramping up late afternoon into the early evening hours. So we'll talk more about that system and we'll talk about your obviously your complete provincial weekend forecast. And of course, we're talking about some of the, the essential storm items that you must have in your house. Chips, of course, bananas, and of course, we can't forget the all essentials. Uh, we'll talk about more about this. Uh, reach out to me on Twitter and Facebook. Let, you, let me know what you have to have in your house. And uh, we'll be back here live at Coleman's with more of your forecast later on. Thank you, Ryan. Now to news from the courts. A sentencing hearing date has been set for convicted murderer Brandon Phillips. Phillips appeared in Supreme Court this morning. On February 22nd, victim impact statements and a pre-sentence report will be heard. Phillips killed Larry Wellman during an armed robbery at the Captain's Quarters Hotel in St. John's more than two years ago. In a somewhat unusual move, two members of the jury were also in court this morning. One, a woman whose identity is covered by a publication ban, hugged Wellman's widow before entering the courtroom. She and 11 others sat through weeks of emotional testimony before finding Phillips guilty of second-degree murder. A big donation was delivered to the food bank in St. John's today. 200 turkeys from Brad Smith of S&S Supply. The donation to the Community Food Sharing Association is an annual tradition for Smith and his son Brandon. They've done it for 10 years. Now, Smith couldn't make the donation in person. He's in the United States battling some serious health problems. So his son delivered the 200 turkeys himself. And he says despite the challenges his family faces right now, they couldn't break the tradition of helping hundreds of other families to have a good meal at Christmas. Just something we, we do every year, and this is something he's normally doing right now, what I'm doing, you know, but, uh, like, he, he wanted me to take part in it this year because he couldn't be here, so I'm more than happy to do that. 200 families out there that got Christmas dinner because of what Brad and Brandon have been doing for the last 10 years, and, you know, given the fact that He's now well and he's out of the country. You know, just thinking of the less fortunate among us. I mean, it's just heartwarming. Now, CBC Radio's Labrador Morning held its turkey drive today as part of CBC's Feed and L campaign. Residents and businesses in and around Happy Valley Goose Bay donated more than $3,000 as well as 445 turkeys. RCMP Corporal Rick Mills says that's not surprising for people living in the big land. Labrador is, is considered the big land, and uh, I think not just because it's uh, geographically large, but it's because it's full of a lot of uh, large-hearted people. And Goose Bay is one of those communities that people just come out in droves to support each other, and um, I think it's just phenomenal. That brings, thanks to all of you, the feed and L total to get this over $90,000. And you can still make a donation if you haven't yet up until January 6th. Just go to our website, cbc.ca slash feed and L day, or you can go to any RBC location in the province. Well, Santa's elves are hard at work in Cornerbrook this week. Firefighters collect and distribute toys to 250 children in the city. Shelves and shelves of teddy bears, dolls and toy guns fill this storage room at the Civic Center. 
They are low on girls' toys for ages 9 to 12. Any donations can be dropped off at the fire station. Firefighters fill bags like these with toys, and parents pick up the gifts next week. Oh, it's very, very good, very fulfilling. Uh, all the guys have a fun time coming up, packing the hampers, and of course, you know, you know what the end, end game is, the kids being happy on Christmas morning. Lots of generosity Absolutely. on the go. Yeah. Well, a rock found recently in Scotland is carrying a spe special message for a family in Gander. Lisa Butler lost her brother to brain cancer last year, and last week, one of his painted rocks turned up overseas. Here now's Garrett Barry has more. When Barry Cole was painting, he was at his best. He picked up the hobby in an alcohol rehab program. It used to calm his demons. It seemed like he was just really content and it brought him to a place that, that I never thought I would see him go to. He was smiling, he was, he was excited. Cole showed his work on NL Rocks, his own Facebook page. It was up just a couple of months before he was diagnosed with an aggressive form of brain cancer. He died at 50. Considering his age, it was very hard to come to terms with. Being with somebody as, as life falls out of their body is uh, excruciatingly painful um, because you feel so helpless and you know it's coming. Butler was torn but decided to keep NL Rocks online. And last week, she got a message. School children in Scotland found a rock with directions to that page. I saw a picture of a rock and a handwriting, and right away, I know my brother's handwriting. It was overwhelming because it was almost like he was speaking to us from beyond the grave. But how did a rock painted in Gander end up in Scotland? Butler says her brother used to paint rocks and hide them at parks in town. Her best guess? A tourist picked one up and brought it back overseas. That journey is only part of the magic. And I think in a way he's just, he's just still giving us his sarcastic, teasing us beyond the grave. But anything beyond that is how we want to interpret it. So I just, I feel, uh, I feel fortunate that even in his death he's touched somebody else. That's the meaning that I give to it. Butler is asking anyone who knows about the journey to contact her on NL Rocks. She says there may even be more out there waiting to be found. Garrett Barry, CBC News, Gander. Well, the mystery of how the rock ended up in Scotland mm -hmm. is there, but it's lovely to see that his sister got a smile from yeah, it. Absolutely. Rallying for Delilah Saunders to get the liver transplant she needs to save her life.
Welcome back to Here and Now. A Labrador family still reeling from the murder of their daughter four years ago now fear they'll lose another child. Delilah Saunders desperately needs a liver transplant, but she's been denied one. Tom Perry explains the tragic reason why. I don't want my baby to die. I'm just begging them to take this. I want them to help my baby. Miriam Saunders and her husband have made the long journey from their home in Labrador to an Ottawa hospital to be with their daughter, Delilah. The young Inuk activist is suffering liver failure, her mother fearful she may lose another child. She's only 26, same age as my, same age as Loretta was when she was taken. I don't want them to take my baby too. I don't want them to take my baby. Loretta was Delilah's sister. She was murdered in 2014. Delilah told her story when she appeared before the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. She had the best laugh. She had the best laugh. Delilah has struggled with alcohol and received treatment for addiction. Her family says doctors have told them acetaminophen Delilah took for pain contributed to her liver damage, but they say it's her drinking that's put a transplant out of reach. In Ontario, patients need to be sober for at least six months to be eligible. It's a common requirement, but it's been challenged before. When Deborah Selkirk's husband died after being turned down for a liver transplant, she launched a human rights case to try to overturn the province's policy. Because the public believes that alcoholics drink again or people with substance use disorder drink again, they're afraid that they won't donate li the liver of their deceased one because they think it might be wasted. But transplant doctors say the guidelines are about results. In many instances, when, uh, when patients are abstinent from alcohol, um, their liver uh, function recover and they may need not need uh, liver transplantation. Ontario is set to launch a pilot project next summer to look at whether the evidence supports the rules. Delilah Saunders' family worries for her that will come too late. Tom Perry, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, as you just saw, Delilah Saunders is in critical condition due to liver failure. She was flown from Ottawa to a Toronto hospital this morning where she's undergoing tests and getting a second opinion. Well, this group braved the cold outside Confederation Building in St. John's today to show support. The rally coincided with similar protests in other Canadian cities. They're demanding that Saunders receive a new liver. She's in and out of consciousness a lot of the time. She's really scared. She has like her whole life ahead of her. She's one of my really good friends and she deserves a shot. And just because of policies that should not make it okay for anyone to say, oh no, we're not gonna give her a chance. We're not gonna give her a life. Who has the right to do that? Meanwhile, Amnesty International has joined the public outcry. The human rights organization says Ontario's transplant policy is discriminatory. In an open letter to the Ontario Minister of Health, the group said the ruling goes against international human rights standards. Quote, our heart breaks for her family and loved ones, it said. They work desperately to ensure Delilah receives the transplant needed to save her life. She has overcome immense personal challenges following the killing of her sister Loretta, says the statement. Delilah began advocating for the rights of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in Canada. Saunders received Amnesty International's highest honour earlier this year for her advocacy work. And, uh, of course, as we said, uh, she, Delilah, is now in Toronto and getting a second opinion. We'll keep you posted. And a little of this, a little of that. Truth be told, I always dreamed of being on Supermarket Sweep, and this is the, well, pretty much the closest I'll get to that. But we're here at Coleman's tonight. We're grabbing groceries. We're talking about the storm that's on the way and some of the storm preps you love to have on hand in your house as you settle in and bunker in for a little bit of snow and wind. And we'll talk all about the storm itself coming up after the break.
Welcome back to Here Now. Ryan's out and about tonight in the east end of St. John's. He's at uh, Coleman's Groceries. And uh, he's joining us now. We saw you picking up your groceries there, Ryan. But what about other <laughs> people? Are many stocking up for tomorrow's storm? Uh, there's been a constant little stream here, and I think obviously with Christmas coming up, uh, there's already a little hustle and bustle happening. So uh, tomorrow's snow and wind is obviously going to be an impact, especially across eastern Newfoundland, where folks are coming into St. John's or are trying to get out of St. John's, uh, trying to do a little bit of that last-minute shopping, especially the guys out there, I'm sure, if you're like me, and you've got about zero things to purchase. So uh, tomorrow, of course, will be a bit of a hindrance on the plans, and we'll talk more about the timing in just a second. Why don't we start with the watches and warnings that are in place and Environment Canada has actually just issued a winter uh, or sorry a snow squall watch for the west coast that area in blue there it's not labeled this is before I, uh, I left uh, to come out here to Coleman's and you can see where the wind warnings are in, in effect for Port of Basque and also the Straits we have a winter storm watch in effect for the Buren Peninsula, Clarenville and Bonavista and that winter storm warning in effect for the Avalon. And here is why we are talking about the potential for more than 20 centimeters of snow across a good portion of the Avalon. The only exception might be that southeast Avalon. And in fact, uh, based on the latest runs coming in today, uh, looking pretty likely it will see more than 25 to even as much as 30 or 35 centimeters for areas of the western Avalon. And that might include the metro region as well. It really will depend depend on how much mixing we see, but I think right now I'm leaning towards less mixing and more snow, which I think most of us would favor anyway. Uh, again, amounts will drop off as you work your way to the west, uh, just two to five centimeters in uh, Grand Falls, Windsor, and 15 to 25 for the Buren, Clarenville, and Bonavista. Now, let's get into uh, the system itself, which if we back things out here in the satellite and radar, it hasn't even really developed yet. You see the low over the Great Lakes and that area I've circled off Cape Hatteras. Those two will form into our storm overnight tonight. And uh, here is how it is going to play out in terms of your timeline. We'll run this through quickly and you can see through the overnight, still on the little on the, on the breezy side. And by the time we get to tomorrow morning, light winds, pretty good for traveling until we get to the mid to late morning time period. And then uh, that's when it will ramp up, ramp up. So there's your conditions tomorrow morning. And as we move through the timeline for your Saturday, you'll note the snow arriving along the south coast by uh, mid-morning. There's 2 p.m. We're into the thick of it across eastern Newfoundland. Cornerbrook on the west coast, still a few flurries, and it's a quiet day across Labrador for tomorrow uh, with just a few flurries in the mix. Now, as we roll through the, into the afternoon, you can see winds picking up in St. John's, very blustery. That potential mixing over the southeast Avalon maybe into St. John's, and that snow will then continue into the Saturday evening time period. There is a look at uh, your forecast as we roll into the Saturday time period. Uh, temp Temperatures near the freezing mark in St. John's, minus 3 for Central, minus 4 in Cornerbrook, minus 15 in the West, and a little on the breezy side in Nain uh, for one more day. Now, timeline for Saturday night into Sunday. There's the system departing. Looks like the heaviest snow will be done by midnight. Still very gusty through the evening, but the snow done by midnight, or at least most of the snow, with some lingering flurries into Sunday morning and very breezy for your shovel out on Sunday morning and gusty as well. And as we take a look at your Sunday highs, yeah, it's going to be chilly one. So not just breezy, but chilly. And as we uh, roll into your, uh, your temperatures, minus 6 in Central, minus 16 in Labrador City, and uh, minus 10 in through Happy Valley Goose Bay. So we've got, uh, uh, th that's the weekend forecast mentioned. Now we'll talk about uh, the, the week ahead and what that might mean in terms of uh, travel and, of course, the groceries because uh, we've been talking about the fact there's been some boats tied up and uh, they're trying to get onto the island to bring us well some stuff for the grocery stores and, and some stuff for uh, for Santa as well because he gets some of his supplies here believe it or not uh, who am I talking to Ren Ren how are you Ren good now you sold me a 50 50 ticket earlier uh, how's that sale been going for you good good and what are you raising money for the Boys and Girls Club. The Boys and Girls Club. That's a very, very good cause. Now, are you excited for Christmas? Yes. Yeah. What's uh, number one on your on your item list this year? What are you asking for Santa? What's number one? iPod. An iPod. Oh, Santa. Okay. Santa's going to have to deliver there. What, and uh, what's your favorite thing about Christmas, other than the gifts? Making um, gingerbread men. Making with gingerbread men? With my mom. With your mom. That sounds nice. Are they good? Yeah. Yeah? Well, maybe because uh, I bought a 50-50 ticket, you can give me a, maybe a gingerbread man. 
just throwing it out there. Anyway, thank you, Ren, for talking to me. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, too. And we'll have your long-range forecast coming up. Two local high school groups take home big national music awards. That's next. Welcome back to Here and Now, everyone. Well, CBC Music has announced the winners of this year's National Music Class Challenge. They received over 500 entries from across the country, and two of the winners are from right here. Fantastic. Here's Holy Heart High School with their version of Joni Mitchell's Both Sides Now. Keep signs, keep signs, circus crowds. I've looked at life that way. Life that way. But now old friends are acting strange. They shake their heads, they just say I've changed. But something's lost and something's gained. In living every day, every day I've looked at life from both sides now. From win or lose, and still somehow, it's life's illusions I recall. I really don't know life at I really don't know life at all. Gorgeous uh, cover there, Joni Mitchell. Yeah, that's Fantastic. Holy Heart Choir. Yeah, very well done. And now in the instrumental category, of course, the St. Bonaventure's College Band took home the top award. And here they are with the CBC Olympic theme.
Well, it's always a treat to meet our Young Athlete of the Day. This is Bentley King of Grand Bank. Bentley is seven years old, plays hockey with the United Town Pirates. And this is his third year playing, and he's excited for his first tournament. Way to go, Bentley. You are our Young Athlete of the Day. Well, let's go back to Ryan Snodden, who's using an influence to try to get uh, young people to uh, commit to making him gingerbread uh, people. <laughs> he's out in the community, as I mentioned. <laughs> yes, he's out at Coleman's Groceries, the East End of St. John's. Hi once again, Ryan. Hi, thanks very much, Debbie and Anthony. It's true. Uh, they sounded like good cookies. Uh, <laughs> she was talking a little bit more about them after, and yeah, my tummy's grumbling now, although we're in the right spot, because we're here at Coleman's Market, and uh, People are hustling and bustling around, grabbing a few extra items uh, just in case because tomorrow, of course, will be a little on the stormy side. Let's quickly run through your weather on the way headlines because we have to get past that storm coming tomorrow and talk about what's after that. Well, the weather on the way headlines shows onshore flurries in the west. We just talked about the snow squall uh, watches that have been issued for Cornerbrook and the west coast. Quiet and cool across Labrador, though still a little on the breezy side tomorrow along that north coast. Uh, there's the satellite and radar picture. There's the low that is, again, can, uh, creating a little bit of uh, uh, stormy weather along that north coast of Labrador. Santa's run to the north coast has been postponed to Sunday, uh, so uh, with the windy weather there tomorrow. And there's the low I've circled off to the south. It hasn't even developed yet, the one that's on the way tomorrow. In case you're joining us late, a quick recap on what it's going to drop. Again, the heaviest snowfall amounts in the east. I'll update this map tomorrow morning on my Facebook and Twitter pages, but it looks like a solid 20 to 35 centimeters on the way for much of the Avalon, perhaps a little bit less in the southeast. Now, as we take a look at your uh, timeline uh, for the next couple of days, we'll start with that system that is going to be uh, brewing off to the south and tracking in over the next uh, day or so. And here's how it plays out. Note as the snow moves in, through the morning hours tomorrow, really ramping up as that low edges in just southeast of the Avalon. The track is going to be so key. You can see the mixing there across the southeast. If the low is further off to the uh, east, well, then amounts will be higher for the southeast Avalon. Further west, amounts will be lower for St. John's. So keeping an eye on that. Run it right through into Sunday, and you can see where the general flow here is cool and blustery in behind as that low departs. And we are talking about a pretty quiet uh, but still a little cool Sunday into Monday setup. Now, I'm going to pop on the long range uh, forecast here and show you as we roll into the Monday, Tuesday time period, no big systems coming in. That's the good news. I think we uh, have the, the long range forecast map next after this. And you can see where uh, area of high pressure coming in. It's not until Tuesday evening into the overnight that our next system comes in. And that's where we'll have perhaps a bit of a warm-up with some rain possible across parts of the island and snow coming for the coast of Labrador uh, with some accumulation possible for much of the big land as we roll into the Wednesday Thursday time period and then another area of high pressure late next week so some breaks in the action which is good news and we'll get to that in just a second here's your seven day trend uh, note Sunday Monday Pretty nice. The West Coast turns a little unsettled through Tuesday, that next system Wednesday, and then another little break Thursday into Friday. Uh, with temperatures, again, hopefully not too warm to melt the snow that we'll see in the east over the next day or so, and the snow in the west from those onshore flurries and squalls. Now in uh, Labrador, cold is obviously the name of the game here. Uh, over uh, daytime highs, cooler than seasonal, and looking at uh, minus teens right through, and we are looking at Wednesday, Thursday, uh, perhaps that snow moving in from the West. Now we've been talking through the show. Uh, come on in here, uh, Cecil and Bethany from uh, Coleman's. Thank you very much, first of all, for having me. We've been talking through the show about the backlog because of the storm storminess this week uh, in Port Basque. How much has that had an influence on the store here in your shelves? I think the reality is we live on an island. The boats are always going to have an impact, um, but we do have three warehouses in Newfoundland that we're able to keep up and running of. So we're we're doing pretty good so far. We've got amazing store-baked bread, a kitchen making all kinds of delicious food in-house, in so we're doing pretty good. So out of, out of those 350-odd containers waiting uh, on the other side in, in, in Cape Breton, how many of those are set to come here? We have quite a few set to come here, Ryan, and we're always prepared for this because it's always, you know, we always prepare for the inevitable when it comes to being ready for our customers. Good. So, and you were mentioning to me, if there's some breaks next week, which it looks like there will be, it shouldn't have much impact on Christmas? No, it shouldn't. We should be geared up and ready to go for Christmas. We're well prepared. We have, as soon as the 
product hits the warehouse, our trucks, people behind the scenes are getting that right to the stores as soon as possible. And Bethany, we should mention, this is a brand new store. Uh, how are things going, especially with the Christmas hustle and bustle? Fantastic. Uh, it's been a really exciting uh, seven weeks, eight weeks now since we've opened. The community has been so amazing and welcoming to us. Um, and we're looking forward to what the next few days before uh, Santa's arrival brings. Awesome. I've been talking to you on Facebook and Twitter about uh, some of the items that you love to have on hand on a stormy day. Uh, and I've got my shopping cart full. I'll, I'll let you know what uh, some of the ones that you've been mentioning uh, coming up a little later on the show. Welcome back. Well, let's check out who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Happy birthday to Josephine Strzok, formerly from St. John's, now in Cambridge, Ontario, who was 97 years old yesterday. Happy 60th wedding anniversary to Loyal and Lloyd and Shirley Burton of Cornerbrook, whose special day is coming up on the 23rd. Happy 55th anniversary on Boxing Day to Betty and Don McLean, living in Howley. Alexander and Eunice Cull of Lewisport celebrated their 57th anniversary yesterday. Happy 62nd anniversary on the 10th to Frank and Diana Hope of Mud Lake. Happy 62nd anniversary last Sunday to Bud and Mildred Chafe of Harbor Grace. And congrats to Jean and Cater Best of Gander who celebrated their 58th anniversary on December the 11th. And a happy 99th birthday to Millicent Moss from Princeton who celebrated on Wednesday. And a happy 50th wedding anniversary to Fred and Cora Randall in Grand Falls, Windsor. They celebrated last weekend. Happy 90th birthday to Jack Parsons in Bay Roberts, who is still actively working in his business, J.W. Parsons & Son. Happy 96th birthday to Burt Moores from Deer Lake, who celebrated on Tuesday. And a happy 61st wedding anniversary today to Henry and Fanny Lynch in Spaniards Bay. Happy birthday to David Pitt of St. John's, who turned 96th on the 12th. Happy 55th anniversary to Walter and Margaret Alcock of Leading Tickles, who also celebrated on the 12th. Happy 97th birthday to Mildred Kellaway this week. She is in Carbonier. Happy 93rd birthday to Kay Goodyear. Congratulations to Josiah and Patience Paul from Gambo, who celebrated their 61st anniversary on Wednesday. And another couple celebrating on Wednesday. Happy anniversary to Jim and Betty Abbott of Ragged Harbor. They've been married 59 years. Happy 91st birthday to Edna Sacri in Robert's Arm, who celebrated on December the 12th. 
And it's a golden anniversary for Marjorie and Eugene Robson from Bay Vert. Happy 67th wedding anniversary to George and Audrey Diamond in Change Islands. And a happy 90th birthday to James Young, longtime St. John's businessman and owner of Kingsbridge Service Station. Ralph and Olive Fudge in Lewisport, they celebrated their 65th wedding anniversary last Sunday. And a big birthday to tell you about. Happy birthday to Patrick Barry, formerly from Carboneer, now residing in St. John's, who is 103 years old today. Happy 72nd wedding anniversary to Chesley and Lavinia Howell of Paradise. Happy birthday to Samuel White of Gander, who will be 96 years old this Sunday. Happy anniversary to Sam and Barbara White of Gander, who will be celebrating their 68th wedding anniversary December 20th. Hazel and Albert Peach from Cornerbrook will celebrate their 62nd anniversary on the 21st. Happy birthday to Georgina Vincent, who's celebrating her 98th birthday today. Georgina is the oldest resident of Triton and is now in Springdale. Congratulations to Bruce and Colleen Clark on their 50th wedding anniversary. Happy 97th birthday to Margaret Lucas in Stephenville Crossing, who is celebrating her 97th birthday today. Also celebrating today, happy 55th wedding anniversary to Cyril and Daphne Murphy in Burnt Point, Conception Bay North. A happy 58th wedding anniversary yesterday to Marion and Aubrey Pickett in Wareham. And it's a 60th anniversary coming up this Monday for Chesley and Edna Dredge in Black Duck Cove. Birthday greetings to Rosie McLean, who is celebrating her 91st birthday. That happened last Sunday. Rosie is from Shoal Cove East, but now lives in Flowers Cove. And happy birthday to Olive Millie from Springdale, who will be celebrating her 97th birthday on Monday. Happy 50th anniversary to Charles and Doreen Moore of Grand Falls, Windsor, celebrating their golden day tomorrow. Happy 50th wedding anniversary as well to Frank and Jeanette Windsor of Fairyland. Happy birthday to Susie Courage, formerly of Catalina, now in Bonavista, who's celebrating her 101 birthday. Wendell and Ethel Reed of Western Bay with great-granddaughter Claire are celebrating their 58th wedding anniversary tomorrow. And happy 51st wedding anniversary to Pauline and Les Parsons of Labrador City. Congratulations, everybody. So I guess we should check in with our meteorologist who is <coughs> out on the road. Yeah, he is indeed. So Ryan, any final advice from all those uh, storm uh, shoppers? Well, uh, Anthony and Debbie, uh, everybody here and online seem to agree. You got to have the chips. You got to have the pineapple crush. I can't get there. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, I did grab some bologna, which is good. You know, Pepsi. A lot of folks are saying Pepsi. Uh, and of course, any kind of pop and chips. Uh, we're in the right spot here. I uh, hear Coleman's, by the way. And of course, uh, there's also a liquor store here. And there was more than a few people mentioning wine lambs, uh, <laughs> other various forms of, uh, of uh, beverages that you might pick up at your uh, local liquor store. So uh, a lot of great advice. Uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, of course, uh, we are talking about 20 plus centimeters of snow. So some are having fun with it saying, come on, 20 centimeters. But uh, I think it was a little bit of fun tonight. And uh, hopefully everybody can hunker down and enjoy uh, the storm and have fun shoveling on Sunday morning. And then hit the gym on Monday. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Have a great one, uh, Ryan. We'll see you on Monday. Yeah, it was great to see, see you out and about yes. and meet all the people there. Thanks a lot. Have a good weekend. Thanks, guys. Have a great weekend. You, you too. Well, it looks oh. like he's got all the storm staples for uh, hypertension, know. heart disease, and all the other. Uh, <laughs> ah, but moderation. It's just occasional. Moderation. Yeah. Anyway. He did remind me, though. I've got to get my shovels. Like, they don't even know where they are. You really need yeah, them. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for being with us, everyone. Have a great weekend. See you Monday. Okay. Bye now. Yes, true.